because it was crafted in um, 2015, is our list of five values. And our five values have really been instrumental in all of the years since their um, inception, but certainly this year. And one of the ways that we wanna demonstrate how much the five values have guided us through this once in a lifetime experience, a video was created. Uh, thankfully, many of our leadership team members um, submitted videos that uh, our communications director, Erica Mundinger, put together as a brief, I don't know, introduction to this evening and to how much our values have guided us. So I will now play the video. And not quite. District. My name is Kelly Ashmore and I am a kindergarten teacher at Brooklyn Elementary School. During this unique school year, I am honored to be part of the Oregon School District. My name is Kelly Ashmore and I am a kindergarten teacher at Brooklyn Elementary School. During this unique school year, I am honored to be part of the Oregon School District because we have been able to remain committed to our core values. One I truly cannot imagine starting um, in a new space, in a new district during a pandemic. Um, I can't imagine anywhere but here. It truly has been such a, a joy um, as OSD truly has stuck to the values that they said they did when I was interviewing. I have taught for 29 years now, and this year, more than any other, I have felt truly honored to be a part of this school district. Even during these difficult and trying times, we remain, remained committed to our core values. Hi, my name is Susie Weber and I'm a first grade teacher at Brooklyn Elementary and this is my first year teaching in the Oregon School District. One of the first things I noticed when I became part of this district was how caring and professional the educators and staff were at Oregon. The caring and professional educators at RCI and in our district helped and continue to help the students in our classroom to feel supported and valued. And I so appreciated the way that student services, administration, lunch providers, paras, librarians, teachers all came together this year to meet the needs of the students and of each other. We've all gone through huge changes in school, in family, in work, in life and to take that time to connect with each individual student has been amazing. We knew we had to create a classroom environment that was caring and supportive and put the learners first so that they felt comfortable to come to us with questions and concerns, but more importantly that they knew we cared about them as individuals, about their future after leaving OHS. We know that during a pandemic, our focus as teachers needed to be on making connections with kids on their social, emotional well-being and their mental health. But also I can tell you from down here in room 398, my little corner of the district, that our focus on engaging in relevant learning experiences for kids has still been at the front of what we're doing. Our goal this year was to create relevant and engaging lessons that showed our students there are different approaches to many math problems and exploring other options is encouraged. The district focused on relevant and empowering experiences when we chose the essential standards and we were provided the collaborative planning time. This allowed us to be guided by what was most important and to share ideas on how to address them and adjust for the needs of our schedule and our individual students. The flexibility that our students have been able to have to mix their schoolwork with their job work and flow back and forth between the two of them has been amazing and really strengthened the experience our students have had.
An important component of educational equity is that all students have access to rigorous tasks that support learning of grade level. My name is Bonnie Burton. I am an eighth grade case manager at the middle school. Um, and I'm also a member of the equity team. So this year with my colleague, Kit Lively, who's a guidance counselor, we created the OMS Multicultural Student Union. Hello, my name is Christine Hunter and I am the library media specialist at Oregon Middle School. One of our biggest areas of focus in the library is educational equity. And this year especially, we wanted to make sure that all of our students would have access to our amazing library collections and resources. Whether they are phased restart or Oregon online learners, all students are able to access our library catalog and request any books they'd like to read. Then we make sure they, we get those books into their hands. We made the decision to add a new collaborative learning opportunity focused on educational equity. In an equity consultancy, an educator requests a small group of colleagues from our equity team engage with them in some possibility thinking around an equity dilemma. Since March, we have had three equity consultancies, one focused on an upcoming classroom lesson, a second on debriefing a classroom lesson, and a third on a co-curricular activity. Equity consultancies will continue as a support for us to learn with and from each other, as so often we are our own best resources. One of the big questions that we all had going into this school year and looking at a virtual world for a beginning was how are we going to have relationships with students and their families um, to make them feel comfortable at our school or virtually through our school. We use one of the Oregon School District's values, um, the family and community partnerships through the, the use of Ready, Set, Go conferences that we had at the beginning of the school year. Before the school year even started, we came together as a staff to tackle one of our biggest priorities, and that was building meaningful relationships with our students. During this difficult school year, when there were so many transitions between classroom and virtual settings, we made it a point to spend a significant amount of time to focus on social emotional learning and the importance of equity. We provided students with opportunities to join social groups, to talk amongst their peers. We created engaging activities where students were able to work together at a safe distance. And we showed flexibility that provided students and families with a model that worked best for them. The strong partnerships that we have with our community members and our business partners, where they were understanding it's a pandemic. They were understanding that students' schedules were gonna be different and our partners were flexible with our students for their schedules. But to see students flow back and forth between school and work when it was beneficial to both the business and the student slash employee, or to see students be able to have a longer experience every other day of the week rather than shorter experiences every day have been huge positives. I think we have strengthened our um, family and community partnerships and I can't wait to continue that in the future. As a preschool special education teacher, my focus has always been the whole child in a natural learning environment, which includes exploration and play. I love how our school district supports the whole child. That means that we look at each individual student's needs and determine how we can best support their education. This is so important. And as a rotations team, we believe very strongly in the importance of the whole child but what we found with those condensed time blocks is that our kindergartners were doing amazing. They were thriving in all curricula curricular areas and were doing just as well as they did in the past with longer time periods. One decision we made when we went to full days for phased restart was to keep our curricular areas short to still use those same time blocks that we did for half day, but then use the rest of the time in our schedule to focus on the whole child. The one value that continues to come to the forefront for me as a new educator here in the PE and Health Department has been the value of the whole child. I really believe this year showed 
how through a professional, caring, and collaborative effort that's focused on student-centered education, it allowed Oregon to persevere through this challenging year. This district supported us and gave us the tools and the opportunities to be sure we were able to meet our goals. And for that, I wanna say, thank you for allowing me to work in this community. All right, so um, that was a, a snippet really of what is to come. And that is what we've learned, uh, how we have cemented our values and how they truly guided us this year and into the future. Now, after having the opportunity to listen to the input that was collected from all of the school leadership teams, it was um, quite clear that there were some strong overall themes that are highly connected to our values. And of course, you heard some of these themes in the video that we just showed you. Uh, meaningful collaboration and service of our learners, the importance of building authentic relationships, creating or sometimes co-creating learner-centered experiences, ensuring we have safe, and that's not just physical but emotional, safe and inclusive learning environments, and then, of course, our consistent um, attention on the uh, mental health and the social emotional learning that is so important to our students. So what I'm hoping is for those of you who are watching the presentation that others are giving while you are waiting for your turn or for the board members who are here tonight watching is that you'll be able to connect these themes to what is being said over and over and over, as well as being able to connect the values. So now we will uh, start with our four-year-old kindergarten presentation and I'll pass it on to Jackie Amlong. Thank you, Dr. Bergstrom. Uh, I am really excited to present on behalf of our four-year-old kindergarten program. Um, so Dr. Bergstrom, if you could advance to the next slide, that'd be great. Uh, so I, I really wanted to root our presentation in our 4K vision. And so for those of you that are new to our team, um, really, our 4K vision was crafted in the 2018-2019 school year. And though this school year looks very different from those in the past, really the heart of our work has remained the same. And that is instilling a love of learning, ensuring that play remains at the forefront of everything we do, and providing developmentally appropriate hands-on experiences. But more than ever before, our 4K team has tirelessly partnered with families and our community to really meet the needs of all of our children, but also their families this year. Go ahead, Dr. Bergstrom. And so you'll see, um, this, this slide just warms my heart and you can definitely tell in green, you know these are definitely pre-pandemic pictures. But really what this illustrates is the way in which 4K has really had to innovate this year in order to meet our student needs. And some of those innovative solutions, we had to think about um, how do we innovate um, field trips? How do we innovate um, snack time where embedded within that are self-help skills, problem solving skills, socialization, peer conflict. How do you re resolve those things? There's so much um, of our standards embedded into daily life and um, the way that we're teaching kids um, to grow, not, not just pre-academically, but also socially, emotionally, uh, and physically as well. Um, we've relied on parents and guardians in a different way. You'll see one of those pictures up there. You'll see kids in these pictures being closer than, <laughs> I'd say six feet and three feet, but really you can see how close we usually are in 4K. Um, and one of the last ones I'll highlight is just 
uh, the sensory bins on the bottom middle picture of how do we incorporate uh, sensory learning in a different way, especially when many of the times those bins are full of things that are wet. <laughs> so we've really had to rethink and re-strategize in a different way. And we've, we've found in reflecting um, that we've landed on some really innovative ideas. So one of the themes that we wanted to lift tonight was this idea of meaningful collaboration. If you can imagine across our 81 and a half square mile district, we have eight community partners who we are so grateful for, <laughs> but you can imagine that uh, the pandemic actually created an opportunity for us to uh, innovate in the way that we meet and how we collaborate. Um, one of those ways is the, the um, way in which we all tonight are meeting, and that's through virtual meetings. Uh, being able to hop on a computer and instantly we are all together and can jump into what's most meaningful, and that's putting our kiddos first. And so we think about virtual meetings in a different way. We think about um, our meetings for individualized education plans differently. Uh, because when we thoughtfully plan for a few, we know that that benefits all kids. Um, we've overhauled our professional development system this year, which uh, for those of you that are new, uh, we typically meet one Friday a month. It's usually the first Friday. Uh, and we've broken that down into two meetings because at the beginning, um, as we've all experienced, we had to be flexible and adaptable very quickly on short notice. Um, and as we've um, become accustomed to this new norm right now, um, we've been able to build in our own professional learning, um, focusing on trauma-informed care and piloting for CISA 2, um, a book on how do we meet um, kids' needs in a different way this year. And then lastly on this slide, one of the things that I'll highlight is our weekly themed distance learning plans. Uh, in June of 2020, uh, we reflected on how we had met the needs of um, what would be this year's kindergartners and said we did well, but how can we make it better? Um, and so, um, we've kept the template the same but the, the, and the structure the same, but really focusing and being purposeful and intentional about the why. Um, why is fine motor and gross motor activities important for this age? Um, and really being strategic on layering, um, how does this impact my kiddos' development now? And how does that tie to their academic, social, emotional, and overall wellness as they progress and get older? And then um, I will let Renee introduce herself. Um, she's got some wonderful things to say about the authentic relationships we've created this year with our youngest learners. Hi, my name is Renee Martell and I'm one of the 4K teachers here in the district. Um, this year I was really proud of the way that our 4K staff addressed the learners as a whole child. And I think that's something that typically happens in 4K that we're looking at many areas of development. Um, but I think this year, especially, we tried to put a focus on um, building relationships with the kids. Um, we wanted to make sure that they were building strong connections with the teacher, but also with peers, because um, we know this year has been really unique and that um, social interaction has been really limited. So we thought it was really important that they uh, we're coming to a place where they were feeling connectedness and that they had a sense of security in a place that was always changing and is continuing to change. Along with that, as Renee spoke about, um, not only did we focus on um, the authentic relationships that we have with kiddos, but also that extends to the authentic relationships and connections that we have with our families. Uh, knowing that 4K looked a little bit different this year. Uh, and that really started with intentional planning long before kiddos were coming into our classrooms um, with Ready, Set, Go conferences that was mentioned in uh, the video and how impactful uh, regardless of if that was an in-person meeting or a virtual meeting, it set the standard that we are committed to connecting with you throughout the year and frequently um, to be intentional about 
um, how we are sharing about your growth and development of your child, um, and starting that two-way connection of communication early on. It just becomes an expectation built into our system as they progress from 4K all the way through 12th grade. And then we thought about, uh, because of that um, Ready, Set, Go conferences setting the foundation, we consistently then made adjustments to how we communicated throughout the year, um, especially within family conferences, uh, both in the fall and the spring. And then within that, our service delivery model, regardless of if students were in person or choosing our distance learning option, that it, it was an expectation that we continue to stay connected. And then lastly, uh, 4K has the unique opportunity of welcoming in new families for the next school year, actually beginning in January of every year. And if you can imagine, um, we're not able to take in-person tours of all of our sites. So this year, we really focused on uh, creating eight individual tours of all of our sites so that one, families and, and caregivers could experience that. Um, but it's also a way to invite families in who maybe they're moving in um, within the summer. Um, but it gives uh, access to what would have been closed down in a different way while still keeping all of us safe. Then many of you have heard me speak on the importance of family outreach and coaching. Uh, the uh, 4K program is charged with providing at least 87 and a half hours of community and family outreach within a school year. Uh, I think we met that by October <laughs> in just being able to continue those connections. But really the focus of um, being able to connect with our families, and I spoke about it a little bit earlier, is the importance of providing the why. And uh, the reason I, I highlight that is this thought of the reflective process that educators go through to be intentional and purposeful about what we are providing for activities and learning opportunities for all of our kids and families. And in addition, it, it makes the grown-ups and the caregivers understand where we're coming from and that uh, partnership becomes stronger. In addition, we added the Ready Rosie app this year, which is a online uh, software that uses two minute video clips, either in English or Spanish, for our families to access that provides additional um, support and ideas that they can use in their daily life um, to provide self-help skills, problem solving, or pre-academic activities with their, their learners. And again, providing that why. Um, so we've been really excited um, for that opportunity as well. And the picture on the screen is one of our ways to, if you'll remember back to our pre-pandemic slide, um, how do we give kids access to uh, virtual field trips uh, and experiences that they might have had um, had we not been able to um, take field trips. And then as we move on, um, you can see uh, this bag, uh, this picture of bags warms my heart. Uh, this took a lot of collaboration. Um, we provided, on top of those uh, distance learning plans, uh, one of the uh, pieces that we wanted to make sure uh, was to provide accessibility and consistency across all of our sites this year and to ensure that the plans that we were sending home, that each and every kid had what they needed at their fingertips to be able to engage in that content. So um, all of these 217 bags uh, were filled with 32 different supplies uh, that families could use and they didn't have to go searching around their house in order to engage and learn with with their uh, young ones um, so we're really really um, grateful for that opportunity um, and provided booster bags along the way um, to make sure that kids had what they needed in order to be successful and then lastly and hot off the presses um, just yesterday um, I'll, I'll back up for a moment. Um, along with our K-12 staff, our 4K staff has been working through um, 
how best to meet our kids' needs with in equitable instructional models, classroom practices, and supporting the whole child. And as we began reflecting upon that, we recognized that our natural next step was involving our parents. So within that uh, collaborative outreach and partnership, uh, last night in collaboration with the Oregon Public Library and through a grant from the Wisconsin Libraries Transforming Communities, uh, we held a joint uh, 4K story time uh, with the theme of how to have great conversations with young children about differences, diversity, and race. Uh, we collaborated with Dane County Healthy Kids Collaborative and also uh, two pediatricians from UW Health, uh, Dr. Navsaria and Dr. Hauser, um, and provided an event um, that first uh, rooted uh, kids' literature as a conduit for how to have these conversations. So the children got to experience both of these two stories, uh, Saturday and Ruby Finds a Worry. They were read first in English and then read in Spanish to be inclusive of our Spanish-speaking families that joined. And then after the kids um, heard these stories, um, our parents stayed on to have really courageous conversations about how do we begin to or how do we continue to have these conversations with our young children when we recognize that kids notice differences as early as six months. Uh, we had over 40 participants, and we are really excited about uh, the potential of uh, continuing this on uh, within our work uh, next year. So I hope you've heard some takeaways that um, fit with some of the themes that you hear, and I know you're going to hear some um, connected universal themes throughout our 4K through 12 uh, presentation tonight. Um, I think Carrie Jane said it best when she was thinking about her video clip. She said, Jackie, we, we're, this year we're, we're still just doing our jobs, and that's just meeting the kids and what they need and helping families to stay connected. Um, and that really uh, speaks to how our vision and our, our core beliefs and five values are just rooted in everything that we do. Um, and lastly, that even though it, it's a struggle, we're better this year um, just because of the challenges and the ways that we've had to innovate. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, well, it's exciting to follow Jackie because it makes me just want to have a young kid again and experience those things that 4K offers. Nice kickoff, Jackie. Um, I'd love the next slide, Leslie, if you're ready. Um, but before I really say what I wanted to, I just think this picture speaks so clearly to the relationship building that we've done in our district. This is a sixth grade friend who is with our art teacher, um, and she just spends time out at recess, connecting with kids, talking with kids, and it just, I snapped that picture on a whim, and I just love it and want to frame it because it speaks to who we are as a district. So anyone in education knows that the root of all our work is grounded in relationships. As educators, we work hard to develop relationships with one another, with families, and with kids. Over the course of this school year, we've had to strengthen all of these relationships in the spirit of what is best for kids. Across the district, we've remained flexible, responsive, and dedicated to serving our children in this ever-changing landscape of instructional delivery due to COVID-19. Never before have relationships been more important. Kids and families have invited us into their homes through the virtual classroom, and we've invited kids and families into our schools. Together, we've created a triad, staff, students, and families working together to ensure academic success and social emotional well-being. Throughout our time teaching virtually, we have not only met kids, we've met their families, their pets, and caretakers. We found out about their toys, their siblings, what they like for breakfast, and their favorite activities. With persistence, commitment, and meaningful dialogue, we have used that knowledge to build meaningful experiences tailored to the kids that are in front of us, no matter what instructional mode they selected. OSD staff would certainly say that our relationships with students and families have become stronger because of the year that we've had. Tonight, you will also hear about the important 
aspects of our relationships with one another. On site, we have used all staff members in new and creative ways. We have developed a true meaning of team where people have remained committed to helping out in any way possible to support the program's success as a whole. Each site had to begin their year in a fashion that was unlike any other, yet we've succeeded in seeing the value in each and every member of our school community. Across the district, teams have worked closer than ever. They work to align practices, share ideas, and develop plans. We've brought people together in new and unexpected ways. As a district, we're better together. Our meaningful relationships have transformed our practices because of our commitment to one another and to our children. Over the next two slides, you'll see evidence of how relationships have been made better throughout a year that has truly been one of a kind. Next slide. Hi, I'm Dawn Clement and I'm the Reading Interventionist at Forest Edge. And as you have heard, the K-8 buildings at OSD have done something new this year. We began the year with Ready, Set, Go conferences to get to know families and students. And families were given the opportunity of an in-person or a virtual conference. The goal was for families and teachers to meet and share their plan for the year and answer any questions. It was an invaluable way to start the year and build meaningful relationships. We wanted you to understand it, and so we have to share with you a very fun and creative way, a short little poem for you. Hi, my name is Jen Hoppy, and I teach fifth grade at FES. We started the year behind a screen and got to know kids. Wait, what do you mean? We tried something out called Ready, Set, Go, it helped us figure out how to help all kids grow. Families, teachers, and kids met virtually. We got a glimpse into their world. And what did we see? We met siblings, pets, and grandparents too. We learned about strengths, talents, and what they like to do. We shared our plans about the upcoming year and helped to ease any family's fear. These conferences were the most valuable part of getting this year off to a fabulous start. Good evening, everybody. I'm Kelly Pankratz. I'm the instructional coach at FES. And as teachers, we know the research about meaningful relationships. Building positive relationships with our students and families will foster success. So we had many ponderings on how we were going to be able to do that this year in the midst of a pandemic. How were our children going to know members of our school community? How could we bring our entire school together around the same experience? What projects or learning opportunities could we undertake? Before I answer these questions, I would like to say these ending lines from a poem by Edgar Guest. There are thousands to tell you that it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophesize failure. There are, there are thousands to point out to you one by one, the dangers that wait to assail you. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin, just take off your coat and go to it and start to sing as you tackle that thing that cannot be done and you'll do it. Now, through some more clever poetry, you will begin to visualize how we built these relationships in our school with families, staff members, and most importantly, our kids. You will see how we did it. Hello, everyone. My name is Laura Jakey, and I teach kindergarten at Forest Edge. Once upon a time, we built a new school it was during a pandemic, but we still kept our cool. The kids didn't know us and we didn't know each other. So we made Flipgrid videos to show our true colors. Some assembly fun showed off virtual skills, like a minute to win it challenge brought many laughs and thrills. Our school is located on the edge of the trees. The opportunity to be an author was easily seized. Our school book is called The Deep Dark Woods, 
and we hope when it's published, you'll check out the goods. Now that it's spring, seeds we will sow. Over the years, we'll watch our plants grow. When students graduate from OSD, they'll be able to see what their plants came to be. These are just a few of the ways we worked our meaningful connections. At FES, we will celebrate our growth together with happy reflections. And now I believe we turn it over to RCI. Hi, my name is Cindy Olander and I'm the principal at RCI. We wanted to take a few minutes to talk about how we have focused on mental health and social emotional learning through the K-6 experience. While focusing on the whole child and creating safe and inclusive environment, we found ourselves really helping and thinking about mental health and social emotional needs. Due to this focus, we were able to give universal screeners. Screeners were given to parents and students to assess the mental health needs of their children and themselves. After these surveys were taken, administrators, student service, teachers, and staff members in the buildings got together to re re review the results. After the results were reviewed, we connected with parents and students and staff members to see what further we could do. Based off of those surveys that all of our students and parents uh, received, we were able to help parents and students connect to individual counseling through community service, uh, student support groups such as family change, stress and coping, and grief and loss. And we also heard from our students that they needed and wanted social opportunities. So we worked together with teachers, staff to create social opportunities and clubs. Not only did we give universal screeners, but we also really focused on our partnerships with our community. One community partnership that we were able to have was uh, with FACE Kids. And this is where a skilled uh, therapist came in and worked with our school counselors in order to provide support groups for our students. Also, in collaboration with the Friends of Oregon School District, we had an amazing Be a Championship Mentor program. This program has over 30 adult mentors with our students with a focus on building a positive relationship throughout their transitions for many years. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures right here because this is our custodian, Paul Welton, connecting with one of his favorite people in our whole entire school. And this relationship will be a relationship that continues throughout the student's life. Universally, we've been focused on equity throughout all of our schools. As a district, we work together to create an anti-hate speech lessons to promote safe and inclusive environments for all of our students. Not only did we provide our students with this learning opportunity, we took a moment to look at ourselves. We looked at our school libraries and classroom libraries to ensure we had the literature to represent all of our learners. By doing this, we worked to create a library where students can see themselves and others in our schools. Next, I invited Heidi Fink, a special ed teacher at RCI, to talk a little bit about how RCI has focused on social emotional learning and mental health. Heidi? Thank you, Cindy. I'm excited to highlight some of the ways RCI has focused on our students' mental health needs throughout the year with our dedicated social emotional time. At RCI, we implemented daily SEL lessons that all of our staff and students experienced. All staff co taught these lessons together. The relationships that our learners form within the classroom with an adult, in addition to their classroom teacher, truly deepen the connections between staff and students, creating a stronger community at RCI. The same kind of bond occurred between the collaborating staff members. Without all of the committees and individuals coming together to develop our SEL lessons, we would not have been able to implement these important learning experiences. This included Mindful Mondays, where we set the groundwork for the day and the week ahead. Students are invited to take a minute to practice mindfulness in a trauma-sensitive way. They may also participate in a circle where staff post questions related to self-awareness, self-management, identity, diversity, relationship skills, social awareness, justice, action, and responsible decision-making. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, our RCI community participates in the Second Step curriculum, 
where students practice emotional regulation, problem solving strategies, conflict, re con excuse me, conflict resolution, and being assertive when faced with a difficult choice. Because educational equity is one of our core values, this work centers around being inclusive and accepting of everyone. Feel Good Fridays focus on self-awareness, self-management, and equity. At RCI, we are proud to dedicate daily minutes to create this universal experience for our students. It has been integral in building our community at RCI and will continue to be in the future. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna Seidenstricker, principal at Brooklyn Elementary. As you've started to hear the depth of collaboration and partnerships amongst students, families, staff, and at times the greater community were critical to our success, cohesion, and resilience this year. Our Brooklyn team will be highlighting the sense of community that has built and strengthened over the course of the year. Each of our school community communities um, join together with the common focus to reach each and every student and accelerate their individual growth and development as a whole child throughout this difficult year. By beginning to make some key shifts in the way we provide students with services and support, we are finding ways to maximize the opportunities for each student to receive individualized feedback, encouragement, and celebrations of learning. Not only were these moves an effort to make our school system more equitable, they also highlight the caring and professional educators that comprise our staff and are dedicated to our students' growth in both academic and social emotional domains. When a school community is strong, we believe that all stakeholders, students, staff, and families can feel the warmth and positivity as they enter the building, share conversations with one another, and collaborate in support of their students. At Brooklyn, we infuse laughter and spirit into our daily work. And as you will hear, we each view every student as one of our own. All right, hi everybody. I am Danny Valentine and I'm one of our second grade teachers at Brooklyn. Um, so one of the first things that we want to highlight is um, inclusion and individualization. So in years past, what our typical traditional um, intervention model has looked like is really identifying kids through data meetings, um, really identifying which kids need um, intervention, and sorry, the daughter came. Um, really identifying the kids who need the additional individualized instruction. Um, this year, we took a little bit of a different approach, and we, we still have kids who are doing the traditional um, intervention, but we've also looked at Instead of kids being pulled out of the classroom, how can we also meet a wider range of um, students? So this year, like I said, we still have some students who are getting the traditional intervention experience, but we are also incorporating the universal support. So like an interventionist might come in and um, pull a couple kids or do some support within the classroom. And those kids can be any kid within the classroom. It's not limited to somebody who only has like that data that shows that they need extra work. So um, one of the biggest things that we've noticed with this new universal support model is that kids' mindset has really shifted. So in years past, if a kid has needed to be pulled for intervention, sometimes they get a little bit huffy with it, like, oh, I don't really wanna go. But this year, it is like a competition. Like, who is gonna get to go today? I have never had more kids ask who gets to go. And I don't know how many of you have met um, sweet Chris Radcliffe, but she loves coming into the classroom and kids just saying like, oh, do I get to go with Ms. Radcliffe today? Do I get to go with Ms. Radcliffe today? And they love it. So there's been such a different mind shift for kids and we've been able to reach a wide variety of kids this year. Go ahead, Dr. Bergstrom. Hi, I'm Wendy Jacobson, special ed teacher at Brooklyn. Um, the Brooklyn staff have worked really hard the, during this very unique year to build relationships with students so that they feel connected as well as to ensure their academic success. All staff members, including regular and special education teachers, ro rotations teachers, paras, interventionists, um, all work together to provide small group opportunities for students. We provided individualized meetings for those students needing additional assistance to complete assignments. 
We have a great group of paraprofessionals that have supported students during large group instruction, as well as in separate breakouts uh, to reinforce new concepts and assist with assignment expectations. Staff also worked with students during asynchronous instructional periods um, and on the asynchronous Wednesdays. And we have addressed the social emotional well being of students by establishing social groups based on student interests, such as sports, video games, Legos, hobbies. Um, and I happen to know firsthand that the dinosaur lunch bunch in first grade was quite popular this year. So these are just a few of the ways that the staff at Brooklyn um, demonstrate that mentality that these are all of our kids, where we have all pitched in to meet the academic and social emotional needs of our students this year. go to the next slide, please. Hi, I'm Kelly Ashmore. And as you were able to hear twice earlier, I teach kindergarten at Brooklyn Elementary. Our amazing staff at Brooklyn has continued to be extremely flexible throughout this school year. All staff is willing to pitch in whenever and wherever it's needed. This has included available adults taking small groups of students to work on various activities, and cover, covering absences or providing additional help needed at doors, classrooms, lunch or recess at a moment's notice. Staff members have developed and maintained relationships with students and families regardless of their chosen learning model, virtual, in-person or a combination of the two. When changes were made to a student's learning model, classroom teachers held conferences to welcome families and answer any questions they had about their students' change. There have been multiple staff members present and available throughout all parts of the day. These include, but are not limited to, supervision at all doors during arrival and dismissal, hallways to monitor student movement from one location to another, and the facilitation of lunch and recess. Many staff have contributed to making this a safe, smooth, and successful time of the day. Finally, the presence of building subs has been an essential part of making this school year run efficiently. They have been a positive addition to our Brooklyn staff, being familiar with staff members, students, school routines, expectations, and common language of the building. They have been able to embrace their flexible schedule, often filling in for various roles in one day. Staff mental health has improved, knowing that there will be a qualified staff member available to cover and continue the structured schedule within a classroom in case an absence is required. Building subs have also been able to develop lasting and strong relationships with students, including the ability to pr provide consistency in the event that staff members are out for multiple days, check in with specific students each day, and provide extra support throughout the building. Next slide. All right, hi, I'm Jen Lynch, and I'm going to be talking today about how resilient our learners have been this year. We have strived to foster this by creating district-wide lessons and then implementing them in the elementary setting. The focus of the learning was on social emotional learning skills. And the structure of the lessons um, was to begin with an opening circle, then have a read aloud and a classroom discussion based on monthly themes, including confidence, optimism, and perseverance. Students were even nominated and recognized for these quality character traits. And as you can guess from the picture here, our special guest, Bobby the Bobcat, came to honor our MVB, Most Valuable Bobcat Award winners. Hi, I'm Nate McConnell, physical education teacher down in Brooklyn. Oh, Dr. Bergstrom, can we go back one slide, please? That's all right, thank you. And in an effort to maintain a little consistency from years past, uh, we were able to continue our annual tradition of our Kids Heart Challenge, although it, it looked a little bit different this year. Our culminating event this year was an all-school 15 minutes of fitness challenge. Um, classes were able to go live or asynchronous, depending on what worked best for them, although most classes chose live, and it was super successful, really awesome. And it uh, honestly was the first time all year I really felt like a real teacher again. So it was really exciting for me. 
Um, but we had a lot of fun, and even staff members who didn't have classes at the time jumped in and and enjoyed enjoyed the fun too, uh, including Bobby the Bobcat. Um, but the popularity uh, was uh, was was pretty high, and through strong suggestion of both students and staff, uh, it kind of quickly turned into a more of a Friday fitness event, um, which then actually caused uh, more than a few of our staff members to uh, rethink their Friday attire. But uh, I think it was worth it. Next slide, please. Hello, I am Susie Weber, and I am a first grade teacher at Brooklyn. Um, with everyday humor and spirit, positivity flows through Brooklyn. Um, you can see this and feel this throughout our hallways, our classrooms, and the Brooklyn community. Not only do you witness this throughout the day, but you can also see this occur the moment everyone arrives and all staff are greeting and welcoming students to the end of the day when we are jamming to music while we load the buses. <laughs> um, and one way we infuse humor is with a BKE tradition that is stronger than ever, the Friday Funnies, where learners share a joke over the loudspeaker and everyone in the building gets a laugh. So we actually have a little video here for you to witness this. Here I have for you four funny jokesters today who have been practicing and cracking up all the way down the hallway. First up, I have Liam. Nice job, buddy. Why did the scarecrow win an award? Hmm, why did the scarecrow win an award? Why? Because he was outstanding in his field. He was outstanding in his field, get it? Oh, that's a good one, Liam. Next up, I have Sutton. Why did the man throw the clock out the window? Hmm, why did he throw the clock out the window? Because he wanted to see time fly. Oh, good one, he wanted to see time fly. Next up, I have Grace. Knock, knock. Who's there? Interrupting cow. Interrupting cow who? Moo. Oh, that one gets me every time. Good one, Grace. And last but not least, Miss Nora. What did the mama say when it was done? Hmm, what did the mama say when it was done? What? That's a wrap. That's a wrap. Oh, those all made me smile and set me up for a great Friday. I hope they did the same for you. Have a great day, Brooklyn Elementary. Well, I hope you were able to get a laugh out of that. Um, while infusing humor throughout the day, um, Brooklyn also holds a variety of staff events to build community and camaraderie. For example, this year we have had the Great Mask Off, which you can see on the slide, which I had the opportunity to attend and I actually laughed so hard I was crying. Um, we've had new teacher gatherings, virtual ones to get to know each other. We've had Friday workouts, as you heard with Mr. McConnell and our very own school garden that staff and students care for together. Um, and then finally, who's that prowling through the courtyard? That's our very own Bobby the Bobcat. Bobby makes a special appearance to welcome kids off the bus or deliver exciting news to classrooms. And maybe when you visit BKE, if you're lucky, you may get to meet this special member of our Brooklyn community. All right, I am Dawn Goltz, Principal of Prairie View Elementary. The collaboration and partnerships that we've built and strengthened this year has not only been with our students and families, but also with colleagues in our respective buildings and across the district. Our Prairie View team will share about how caring and professional educators have adapted and collaborated in service of our learners. At the K-6 level, we have two team structures that took place on alternate Wednesdays cross-district subject area teams, and professional learning communities, which we'll refer to as PLCs. You'll see how these structures are intertwined and how our collaboration has benefited all learners. The collaboration resulted in the creation of rele relevant and empowering learning experiences that value the whole child and recognize the needs of all learners. Mary Hermes, Hermes administrative intern, will highlight what collaboration looked like at the K-6 district level. Next slide. Oh, right here we go. Good evening. 
As a district, we utilize our district subject area committees or SACs as a means of cross district collaboration. We'll talk about how these took place, what took place and how our work was accomplished. SACs meet with grade level representatives from each building, along with specialists, coaches and administrators. This year, these meetings took place on Wednesdays, where we had two and a half hours of dedicated time that guaranteed all stakeholders were available and present. Our biweekly SAC meetings served as a vehicle for continuous reflection and improvement. The work started back in the summer when teams met to identify essential standards for subjects that served as guideposts throughout our year. From there, teams then identified the prerequisite skills that were needed and allowed for teachers to front load teaching and learning. Additionally, teams worked to get, build a guaranteed and viable curriculum to ensure all learners have an equal opportunity to learn, which is work that will carry forward and continue in the future. Our work this year has resulted in better horizontal and vertical alignment across grades. Having all stakeholders and multiple perspectives around the table allowed for in-depth conversations around curricular decisions related to materials, units, and lesson design, as well as assessment. The SAC, SAC time always ended in a whole grade level share out that was led by a coach where each subject area was able to then summarize their work and their next steps. This ensured clarity for all and resulted in cohesion between buildings and between different instructional models of Oregon Online and Phase Restart. Administrators were present at the SAC meetings and at the share out and were available to troubleshoot or respond to any questions or concerns that teachers might have had in the moment. This supported teachers in feeling heard and minimizing anxieties related to the unknowns of our school year. The frequency of meetings resulted in strong collaborative relationships across buildings. We strength strengthened our collective efficacy and extended it beyond the walls of our own individual buildings. All children in the district were our children. And now Dawn is going to talk more about PLCs. This year, teachers had dedicated meaningful collaboration time every other Wednesday to participate in building level PLCs. This uninterrupted time allowed for all teachers to participate in collaboration. In the past, there have been challenges with having staff from all instructional areas attend PLCs due to building and staff schedules. PLCs this year could include everyone, such as homeroom teachers, special education teachers, instructional coaches, interventionists, advanced learning teachers, rotation teachers, and administrators. In some way, PLCs are similar to our district SACs that you just heard Mary talk about. During PLCs, building teams continued their collaboration in service of learners. The work between SACs and PLCs is intertwined and built off one another. During PL PLC time, grade level teams, along with specialists, coaches, and admin, continued their work of identifying form form formative assessments and making curricular decisions to ensure essential standards are being targeted. Teams also spent time critically evaluating their curriculum and instructional practices all the while while reflecting. PLC teams analyzed student data from common assessments and identified common challenges, then created actionable steps to help move all students forward. PLC time also allows for our educators to have in-depth conversations around students and use the knowledge of our specialists to identify additional supports. We use the information gathered to identify and apply appropriate and impactful evidence-based instructional practices that value the needs of every child. The PLC structure thrived because of the strong relationships that teams built and nurtured. We strengthen our collective efficacy as we tap into our colleagues as resources. By including all stakeholders, we deepened our knowledge about students as individuals, as each educator brought their unique experience to the table to speak to the students' academic, personal strengths, opportunities, and personal backgrounds, which painted a picture of the whole child. Teams set high expectations for themselves and for their learners. Next, Allie Gill, a third grade teacher, and Lauren Main, a first grade teacher, will share a little bit about our Prairie View PLC journey. Hi, I'm Lauren Main. I'm a first grade teacher, as Don said, at Prairie View. Uh, when we first introduced PLCs in Oregon, it was truly more of a common planning time. And once the trust in the structure was established, it grew into an extended PLC time 
because we needed some more time to discuss data and to continue to better support our students. Now with a focus on equity, we've started to implement the PLC Plus model this year. Hi, I'm Allie Gill, third grade teacher. Uh, this year, our leadership team participated in shared learning around this PLC Plus model. It was a space for us to learn, take and apply, and then come back together to reflect. Now, a successful PLC model doesn't happen by chance. It requires a strong activator that serves as a catalyst for the successful work of our PLC team. Our leadership team used the tools provided in the activator's guide to learn how to be a strong activator. Part of being a strong activator includes creating a structure and purpose to focus our work in order to amplify our collective impact on teacher and student learning. So as activators this year, we work to grow our capacity by taking on the responsibility of building purposeful PLC agendas that supported our students' growth and achievement. And this really shifted our PLC process from a simple list of tasks to providing a structure that enabled focused conversations around student data with more embedded formative assessments than in the past. During uh, leadership team meetings, we took time to share agendas and provided each other with feedback. Our activator roles strengthened as we revised and reflected on how our agendas supported our teams in meeting their goals. On my first grade team, as well as the other teams in PVE, this process was instrumental in developing the flow and productivity of our PLC time together. This extraordinary year brought a sense of urgency to our team um, collaboration time. So when I built new agendas this year, it was crucial to gather feedback from other leadership team activators, administrators, and coaches so that my team's time was really focused on those critical goals and conversations around student growth. Our leadership meeting time provided a safe space for this pre and post PLC meeting reflection. And over the year, I've made adjustments to give interventionists and SAC reps space to share information, learned what types of meeting structures are best for various data sets, and included formatting tweaks, just to name a few examples. And I can confidently say that PVE's PLC Plus meeting agendas were a piece of the puzzle we could not have done without this year. The PLC Plus Playbook is an amazing resource that has numerous interconnected protocols. These protocols contain targeted questions that help to keep the data alive. Using these protocols allowed us as activators to better analyze student data and take actionable steps which strengthened our universal instruction and increased our effectiveness as a, as a PLC team. In January, the third grade team used a Notice Like Wonder protocol to analyze our winter reading data. Our guiding question was, how can we support all students? We noticed that, our, that work, work and fluency were concerns across the grade. We brainstormed different ways to support students in these areas, either in person or online, like incorporating more shared reading, utilizing spe specialists and paraeducators creatively to support specific students, assigning individualized learning opportunities, and making sure our small group reading sessions included repeated readings and focused specific focused on specific word work attack skills. Each member of the team implemented these actionable steps and shared observations to the fo at, the, uh, at the following PLC to drive our future work. Having these actionable steps was something that wasn't as prominent in our past PLCs. As we became more familiar using protocols, my team tailored them to ensure that our work was student-centered, equitable, and data-driven. Thank you, Allie and Lauren. Community is the operative word in the PLC Plus framework. As a member of the community, each individual's contribution has the power to directly impact and accelerate student learning. Teaching is a practice and requires just that. The time PLC teams have together strengthen our individual and collective efficacy and have a positive impact on student learning. Netherwood will highlight how our work in SACs and PLCs impacted learner-centered experience. Thank you, Don. I'm Chris Cluck, principal at Netherwood Knoll Elementary. A few minutes ago, one of our members texted me to suggest I quick craft a poem. I have not been able to pull off that feat 
So the best I can hope for tonight is for my presentation to sound a bit like an infomercial. Since it's being recorded tonight, I could post it on YouTube to provide supplemental retirement income in the near future. I doubt that'll happen. Uh, also, because of our great Netherwood Knoll Elementary uh, leadership team and their Jedi mind tricks, and the, speaking of retirement, they convinced me to uh, shoulder the load tonight. So thank you to them for convincing me once again. So I want to say thank you to our K6 colleagues for their excellent presentations and for sharing so many concrete examples of what we have, what we have accomplished and hope to amplify in the future. Secondly, I'd like to thank them all for the opportunity to close the K6 portion today with an emphasis on how our work has continued our path forward progress and is aligned to our previous understanding of the five levers to improve learning. Some of us are more familiar with the five levers, so I'll begin with a quick introduction, although I was tempted to turn it over to Dr. Rickaba to tell us a little bit more about it, but I'll use the back of his book, of his book instead to say, the five levers are about where do we exert influence to improve learning? Why are some of the initiatives that are least likely to improve student learning given so much time and resources? What are the characteristics of initiatives that are likely to succeed? By understanding the potential and limitations of initiatives related to structure, sample, standards, strategies, or conceptions of self, educators can more mindfully and powerfully connect efforts and resources to intended outcomes. With the goal being not just better teaching, but an impact on learning. You will notice on the upcoming slides that there's a notation on how our actions this year have aligned to the levers. Our experiences the last 14 months have been a catalyst for us to not only focus on content, but to design for learner-centered experience. When we put the learner at the center, we are emphasizing the change in our traditional relationship. No longer are we student and teacher, but now learner and facilitator as co-authors of their learning experiences. Beginning in March, on March 13th, 2020, we had to suddenly overcome a century of inertia and habits to redesign the learning experiences we offered. This has truly been a catalyst to gain traction on our path forward work and required us to put each learner at the center. First, let me thank the board for your understanding and support of the need for collaboration during this time. While it would have been tempting to try and simply mimic the past, what was required was constant designing and creating for what our learners needed. To do this, in what ways has that played out? Well, we started with our curriculum work on identifying the essential standards, beginning before the pandemic even, and this provided needed focus, and teachers have shared how this allowed them to see how our school day could allow for more. For example, I would ask you to consider our kindergarten classrooms. At the start of a typical year, they can have a range of little human beings with them that have walked the face of the earth anywhere from 60 months to 72 months. Think about that. In what 12 more months on earth can provide a child at that time in their development? Or potentially not provide because we never really know the range of experiences they bring to us. These little humans, in fact all humans, learn best with context which is what we need to provide, like applied social emotional learning experiences that some might call play, but are scaffolded by talented early learning specialists. Putting the learner at the center also happened this year by further engaging in issues of social justice. The experiences of our nation this past year has drawn us closer to our OSD equity value and for our need to lead the Oregon community to create safe spaces and belonging for every child and family.
The following moves on our part are aligned to the strategy lever and most importantly contribute to building the capacity of our staff to put the learner at the center. Teachers are in need of these tools to travel our path forward. Tools such as some of the, some of the uh, adaptive uh, tools that we adopted this year to supplement and differentiate curriculum, such as Dreambox or Lexia. The use of learning management tools like Seesaw and Google Classroom has grown our capacity to differentiate and support more individualized needs and grow independency in our learners. And providing virtual options has shown us that there are multiple modalities with which we can reach our learners and grow our capacity to put the learner at the center. While building staff capacity, these actions also build the learner capacity to move from dependent to independent. If you don't mind, I'd like to share a little bit from a recent article in the Educational Leadership Magazine by John Hattie titled, What Can We Learn from COVID Era Instruction? He notes three big takeaways. One, educators led the charge, which happened in Oregon. Two, independent learners and empowered, and empowered teachers succeeded. And three, successes outweigh the losses. With regards to independent learners and our empowered teachers, he says, those who were most likely to succeed were students with higher self-regulation skills, whereas those most dependent on the teacher or those who had teachers who over-orchestrated their classes struggled the most. Teachers who had taught their students skills and self-regulation engaged in gradual release of the teacher responsibility and focused on both content and deep learning had better outcomes. There is a need to focus on how teachers successfully modified and structured their lessons to be more student-centered during the pandemic. And we must bring these ideas back to the regular classroom. We cannot revert to teacher-dominated talking and questioning. So as you can see, the reflections we share today from our experiences are not solely our own. As you saw on the five levers slide, it is the self-lever that has the highest impact on learning. It is through relationships and connections that we engage a child in learning. Earlier, you heard evidence of how we focused on that this year. You also know how much we adapted our model over the course of the year. And we remind ourselves that time should be the variable in our learning equation, as seat time in teaching does not always equal learning. To bring perspective, I rely on the words of John Hattie again. But rarely have educational interventions been successfully scaled up. Too often we look for failure and aim to fix it, whereas we need to look for success and aim to scale it. We have developed a grammar of schooling that seems to serve many students well, but sadly we often label and find explanations relative to students who do not fit this grammar. Too often we find ways to name and blame the student for not learning or benefiting from our teaching, rather than questioning our teaching and looking at ways it could be improved based on examples of more effective practice. Our path forward is now to scale all the successes we have seen. Finally, where and with whom we learn, we're challenged to be flexible this year in order to put our learners at the center. At NKE, prior to the pandemic and throughout, we have been thoughtfully reconsidering the experiences of our earliest learners. We are eager to continue the conversation to learn from others, either by way of book studies or engaging with projects like the Pedagogy of Play out of Harvard. As a K-6 team, we all anticipate the opportunity ahead of us to take what we have learned and to move forward on a path to keep every learner at the center. As we engage in the coming months in the strategic planning process that will update the portrait of a graduate and launch goal setting, we will challenge ourselves to backward design from that portrait to where we start with our 60 to 72 month old children. We will amplify our success 
and we will think deeply on the experiences our learners need to build the skills, knowledge, and dispositions to be independent learners who ultimately stay happy, healthy, curious, and proud graduates of the Oregon School District. Thank you for being mindful as a board to how we begin the learning journey and not just the portrait of the end, as being attentive to the beginning is how we get upstream. I'll turn it over to the middle and high school. Well, actually, well, actually, thank you. Um, <laughs> we were thinking of maybe taking a three minute stretch break. Um, please, elementary uh, or K through six, four K through six teams, if you're able to, please stay on. It'll be so much fun to see the 712. But we just thought three minutes to allow um, board members to um, move their legs a little bit would probably be a good thing before we move into the 712 section. So at exactly 622, we will begin 712.
<laughs> Hello again, everybody. Uh, we are back. Uh, thank you for the three minute stretch break. I know I didn't need it because I am pretty excited about listening to all of you <laughs> and everything that you have to say about our progress as a district. And now I'm going to turn it over to our 712 colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Bergstrom. My name is Jim Pleiner and I am the principal at Oregon High School and we are very pleased and proud to hear of the fantastic work of our 4K6 colleagues. Dr. Anderson and I have had the opportunity over the course of this school year to address the board um, at many different points about the work at the high school. And we, like you have heard to this point, none of the progress that you will hear on the important initiatives and the focal points tonight would have been possible without the extraordinary efforts and commitment and the leadership from our dedicated educational professionals in this district. Every teacher, every administrator, every support staff member, every student services um, professional have been dedicated to making this happen. Uh, you'll hear again tonight in the 712, much like you did in 4K6, no deficit thinking. We are not wringing our hands uh, in the middle of a pandemic. We are still building and we're building things that will carry forward from this point. Dr. Anderson. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon Anderson, and I am the principal at Oregon Middle School. Um, over the course of the last month or two, both the leadership teams at the middle school and high school engaged in a process that helped us to identify uh, practices that we started and stopped during the pandemic and those we want to start and stop moving forward. And um, after our leadership teams met, Jim and I got together and were able to synthesize two big overarching themes that I think you've already seen this evening from our other colleagues. Um, but the first really big idea is that we really realized in this process that meaningful collaboration and service of our learners was critical for the success of this year. And we're gonna flesh that out for you tonight. The other big theme, and you've heard it tonight too, is that whole focus on student-centered learning. And when we reflected on all the information our leadership teams gathered, we were able to divide that up into four sub-themes. So tonight we're really gonna talk about the academics, the teaching and learning piece of that how we leverage technology to serve our students, the mental health, whole child, social emotional learning um, and what that looked like. And then lastly, how we made meaning of equitable experiences. So last week, uh, the Oregon Fire Department came to the middle school and they burned our prairie. And as I was watching all this debris go up in flames, uh, it made me think about why do we burn a prairie? And we burn a prairie for several reasons. We burn it to eliminate the dead organic matter and plant material that's built up over the last couple years. Um, that burning puts nutrients back into the soil. It creates bare patches of earth so that new seeds can germinate and grow. It increases biodiversity and it strengthens the prairie in the long run. And as I was watching the flames consume all the dry grass, it made me really think about how this pandemic has been like a prairie fire to the way that we make meaning of teaching and learning and education in our schools. And so when the pandemic came, we were forced to get rid of processes, change things, make changes, um, and it, at times we maybe felt like we were being consumed by flames as we were trying to figure everything out. Um, but in the end, the process allowed us to come up with, with new growth and new ideas um, that maybe wouldn't have happened before that make us stronger. And so tonight as we move through um, some of the pieces from the middle school, um, we wanna highlight those sort of metaphorical plants, um, new species, uh, new things that are coming um, from how we make meaning of teaching and learning with our kids. To start us off to talk about the first theme, uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna hear from our two instructional coaches at the middle school. Hi, I'm Laura Brudos, and as Shannon said, I'm a halftime instructional coach at OMS, as well as halftime Spanish teacher. And I'm going to get us going here by talking about the theme of meaningful collaboration and service of learners. Uh, when we as a leadership team reflected on the ways in which we supported our students in their learning, our use of new collaborative structures really stood out to all of us. 
and we collaborated with colleagues in a variety of ways this year. Uh, teams of teachers have been meeting weekly using the PLC Plus framework, which was talked about earlier. So I'm glad you have a little reference to that. Uh, we had discussions about curriculum, instructional strategies, and student learning by focusing on and answering the framework's guiding questions, which are, where are we, where are we going? Where are we now? How do we move learning forward? What have we learned and who's benefited and who is not? So those meetings were um, highly valuable in the student learning process. In addition, we've also been conducting regular meetings between staff and students to provide individual academic or emotional support to any student in need, very personalized. And in addition, the ability to have interdisciplinary team meetings has been especially meaningful to those of us who due to our normal daily schedule don't typically have the chance to meet as part of an interdisciplinary team. We're usually teaching the kids while the team teachers have their meeting. Uh, but with Wednesdays, we were able to attend those. And with so many more educators in attendance at these meetings, we were all able to develop a more complete understanding of our students, their performances and their needs, and develop more comprehensive plans to address those needs. Um, I'm going to now hand it off to my coaching colleague, Andrea, to talk about uh, the other bullet points that we have, how we've collaborated this year at OMS. Hi, thanks, Laura. I'm Andrea Fuller. I am um, one of the instructional coaches at Oregon Middle School. And um, to pick up where Laura left off, so we did um, utilize our Wednesday time to forward um, the collaborative structures and partnerships. I viewed Wednesday as like my social day because I was able to work with so many PLCs and join teams. And so like during a pandemic, that to me was like social hour and like enjoyment and like coming together um, to, you know, in service of our learners and students and then um, coming together to problem solve and work like we had not like in a new level and really find each other's strengths and leverage those um, to benefit all learners. So we were able to have 712 curricular projects, um, new educator supports that were virtual. See, we did coffee, so you can see all of the new educators with their mugs there. And um, also we implemented um, authentic intellectual work um, with the support of our high school colleagues. And so if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so we will take a closer look at um, the AIW Authentic Intellectual Work Framework um, at Oregon Middle School. It's a framework that's in partnership with UW-Madison and um, it promotes collaboration um, and also provides our students with relevant and engaging learning opportunities and experiences based on um, the scoring rubrics, which, any, so if we can play the video, that would be ideal. So one of the exciting changes that happened at Oregon Middle School this year was the implementation of the Authentic Intellectual Work Framework as a tool for collaborative professional development. While the high school has been using for AIW for several years, it was new to OMS this year. And on a weekly basis, a total of nine teachers in two separate groups would meet to analyze, discuss, and provide feedback on each other's work. Um, the work included teacher tasks and instruction, as well as student work samples. And the use of the AIW framework allowed us to focus on the intellectual rigor and the relevance of learning, and as a result, enhance and improve the depth and the richness of the student learning experience. The AIW framework provided a truly collaborative, job embedded, relevant, ongoing professional development opportunity that embodies the OSD's value of having caring and professional educators. Um, just to follow up with the AIW, so those, um, those our teams that met really did um, increase like and really reflect on our instruction and what we were asking our students to do and increase our rigor and come together and um and my idea like my weekly meeting with my AIW team was the highlight of my week and they're amazing people um who really made me a better coach and teacher and that transferred into like all areas of my job and not just my AIW team um so we're going to move on to the academics um and our collaborative structures 
They really helped us advance our five values, and now you can learn about the academic component of that. Hi, I'm Megan Tui. I teach art at OMS. Um, so the pandemic challenged us to think deeply about our instructional strategies in order to focus on the needs of all learners. That includes um, identifying our essential standards, creating more targeted formative assessments, more engaging learning activities, more connections between disciplines, and really thinking about the learning experience from the perspective of the students. Hi everyone, I am Sydney Weiss. I am one of the eighth grade math teachers at OMS. Um, as we all know, technology inevitably played a critical role in serving our students this year. By using a common learning platform, Google Classroom, all students were able to easily access all learning materials. By flipping our instruction, we were able to make the most of our synchronous time with our students so we could focus on understanding and targeted support. Using new tools like Pear Deck, Edpuzzle, and Desmos made it possible for us to assess student learning in different ways. And lastly, technology allowed us to meet with home adults virtually, which made those partnerships more equitable and convenient for our families. Hi, I'm Jason Zerwick, the Associate Principal at the Middle School. When we thought about student-centered learning this year, we also thought about the whole child. We included lessons each week in connections regarding social and emotional learning. For our explicit social emotional learning instruction, we continued to use Second Step, a research-based SEL program. Our Second Step lesson focused on four themes, mindsets and goals, recognizing bullying and harassment, thoughts, emotions, and decisions, and managing relationships and social conflict. The second step lessons are taught on Tuesdays in Connections. Our wonderful SEL coach, Jana Pliner, works with OHS teacher Juanita Weinert and high school student leaders from the I Teach class to, hate, to help make the lessons meaningful and more relevant for our students. The OHS student leaders were also able to particip participate and help lead the connections during first semester. We also offered a wide range of groups through student services as well as virtual clubs such as Animal Helpers, which was a virtual club um, for students who have or love animals. And the focus of Animal Helpers was to help regulate emotions um, through pet therapy. Um, experts would come in and work with our students as well as our um, wonderful uh, student service staff members um, with the goal of helping students reduce in, uh, anxiety by regulating their emotions. Another um, high interest group that we had was snack break and that was offered um, on Tuesdays earlier in the school year and then it shifted to Thursdays. Um, and this was a group um, for any student to join. It was all inclusive. Um, and the focus was really helping students who might, have, might be feeling isolated um, through the pandemic. Um, it was an open link, like I said, for any students. Um, we had a lot of guest speakers. I know Dr. Anderson um, was a guest speaker or a guest host on, on the snack break. I jumped in one day as well as uh, Katie Anderson, our administrative intern, as well as many other staff members. Another group, uh, Black Student Union, which is an infinity group, um, and that group focused on unpacking on what's going on around us, as well as helping students shared um, experiences. Last month, we administered the behavioral and emotional screening system. Um, you might know it as the best screener to our seventh graders in connections to also help us identify students who, some, who need some additional mental health supports. And then finally, um, one of the strategies that we are most proud of this year is the way we leveraged connections to support students and their families. Dr. Bergstrom, can you transition to the next slide and play a clip um, to hear firsthand how connections impacted our learners, their families, and our, OH, our OMS staff members? 
So OMS has been doing connections um, for many, many years, but this year really presented us with an opportunity to use that time with students to support not only the student, uh, but their families, their parents, their adults in their life. Adults was to have students in our connections class that we also had in our subject area. Uh, so this deepened the connection, the time that we had with students, and, and it really allowed us to get to know them even more so than we would um, in just those 25-minute sessions four days a week. Uh, we also had three different uh, conferences with parents throughout the year, all presented an opportunity for students to ask questions, adults to share their concerns, ask questions, tell us what was going well, uh, and also plan for the future. So Connections uh, was uh, different, a little bit different each day. Monday and Tuesday were times to reflect and do some class discussion and some sharing, but throughout that uh, process, every Monday, students really got to know one another. Um, and know each other in a way that they might not get to know each other in their subject area, like orchestra, for instance. Um, they might share things about their personal lives, about their hopes and dreams, about future plans, about concerns, about goals that they have. Um, the other thing students get to work on in Connections on Tuesday is their social-emotional learning. And those lessons throughout the year really help students um, learn about themselves. Uh, the lessons were a way for them to think about how to manage emotions, deal with conflict and resolution, goal set, manage time. Um, it, it also enabled us to uh, share what was happening in the rest of the school and with other students throughout the school and community through our Friday uh, OMS at, uh, at Home productions. Um, we had quite a production team um, that put together really beautiful collages of things going on in the school, celebrations, Black History Month, all sorts of things that were, were happening in all subject areas and, and throughout some of our um, student groups being together and celebrating what was going well and um, and celebrating our learning together and getting to know one another. I think Connection has supported me because it just gives me, you know, like a space to talk um, to my peers. Um, it's just a place to, you know, talk about your experiences and your emotions. And, you know, sometimes that's just a good break. You know, sometimes it's fun because, you know, you get to talk about music and connections too, because all of my um, connections classes in orchestra so you know that's sometimes nice to have like a little crossover um as for miss black um she supported me ju by just you know being a kind teacher um when i come into the group meet every day she, you know she's always smiling and kind and that you know helps everyone feel welcome and it just it makes you happy you know she's always like you know said if you're if you're um having trouble learning with anything or you know you're stressed you're stressed out about anything in your other classes you know reach out to me and i can reach out to somebody else and you know while i haven't you know taken up her up on her offer yet you know it's always nice to have that in the back of your mind that she's always you know there if you need something if we had questions we knew we could go to her she's always willing to follow up on things and get back to us if we needed it and i think absolutely in this year where things are so far from normal, right. having someone there just to sort of just confirm, you know, Caroline, she went through their schedules and connections and, you know, so everyone knew where they were supposed to be, when they were supposed to be there. We knew she was being really well supported in that capacity that makes us obviously feel better as parents that she knows at each of these transition points what's going to be happening next. Um, it gave us a chance just to get to know her a little bit better, which in a year like honestly i feel like we had more communication than we might have had in a normal quote unquote true. normal year so i look at that as a, a positive you know while we know that she's always available if we have a question we could email at any time or call or whatever those conferences and those milestones are nice too because you have these lines or demarcation points where okay we're checking in and kind of getting a summary mm -hmm. so that's great it was good i want to say thank you to the district for really making sure that the online only students, which is what Caroline has been an online only student for the whole year, um, have been supported and have had continuity in their educational experience. That was super important to us as parents. And we hope the district feels supported by the parents. Yeah, for so sure. For sure. You know, that goes both ways. So it really is something that we'd like to see continue having that um, our Connections students be a part of our other subject areas and uh, Connections teachers really working as a point person or an advocate for students and for families to get the help and the support and the guidance that they need to be more successful.
Okay. Um, I'm Bonnie Burton. I'm an eighth grade case manager, special education at OMS. And this is not my slide because it's Katie Anderson's. <laughs> I was just, I was just going to let you take it, Bonnie, but you know. <laughs> Collaboration. See? I, did, I didn't want to cut you off. So hi, I'm Katie Anderson. I'm the administrative intern um, at OMS. And you know, looking at those equitable experiences, we were able to um, center student learning um, by making it more equitable through technology. Uh, we were able to leverage uh, a range of technology tools. Uh, students were able to access and engage in the same instruction, regardless of whether they were Oregon Online or Phased Restart, um, which was also a great thing for any of those students who, uh, you know, in this crazy year had to quarantine or had to miss. Uh, the technology tools were also used um, also provided to students more ways to participate and share their thinking, such as things through like the chat features and interactive slides. And uh, staff found that's really helpful for students, um, especially those students who have anxiety or might not usually verbalize um, in class what they're feeling or thinking. We were also really excited about the ways we included student voice to make our school more equitable. Um, as Bonnie mentioned in the beginning video of, of this presentation, uh, OMS added a multi multicultural student union, um, which was based on student request. We also had our Gay Straight Alliance lead a staff meeting and staff training. And the GSA and the, the Black Student Union helped us with developing our anti-hate speech lessons, um, as well as uh, other lessons throughout the year and providing feedback on some of those connections lessons that uh, both staff and students have found val valuable throughout the year. Um, but tonight we want to um, highlight uh, the curricular audit tool that we've been using at OMS um, and started this year. And then that's where I'll turn it over to Bonnie. All right, it's Bonnie again. Um, and this is my slide. So um, I'm also a member of the equity team. So over the summer, our, our equity team developed a tool that each teacher in our school could use to analyze their curriculum in accordance with the district statement on racism and designing learning experiences that are inclusive and culturally relevant. Um, this tool, it helps teachers examine the voices, power dynamics, representation, and how students of all backgrounds are engaged in our curriculum. Um, so as a staff, we took time in our departments to analyze one unit and we put it in place um, to have an action plan to make changes. And if the next slide shows three examples of how, like what came from that, what resulted from that. Um, the first example comes from our music department who used the curricular tool to guide their work developing lessons in this unit um, where you can see Motown is being showcased. And they, they did this as a way to ref for students to reflect upon the strengths and the shortfalls of the music and the music industry. Um, as well as the music's ability to both reflect the history and the culture and, and how it influences it. Um, they adjusted this lesson to show how the systems of power began to shift through the phenomena that was Motown. The second example comes from the science department um, and uh, their unit on climate change. So as they worked on reading more from indigenous voices about conservation, and sustainability, they realized the importance of acknowledging the land that um, OMS and our other district schools are built on. So this is a slide that was at the beginning of their presentation. Um, and this third example comes from the English department. So our English teachers took a novel unit and they expanded it to provide more diverse representation of authors and characters and experiences. Um, and they actually discontinued the use of a favorite, The Outsiders, um, which was a difficult choice, but um, a good one due to its anti-Indigenous references, the way it represents women, and because all of the main characters really represent the dominant culture and they're all white males. Um, so we're really excited for the changes the curriculum tools helped us make this year, and we're really looking forward to its continued use in our building. Andy Faulkner, physical education teacher. We'd like to finish the middle school presentation by highlighting one of our favorite new strategies from the past year. The Ready, Set, Go, and later the Ready, Set Transition conferences focused on supporting the whole child 
and strengthening our partnership with the students and their families. Before we pass the presentation on to the high school, we'd like to share some video testimonies from three of our middle school students. Hello, my name is Kevin Gasner. Um, I am a seventh grade teacher at the Oregon Middle School, and I have three of my Connection students here with me today to talk about Ready, Set, Go conferences and the way that those conferences helped prepare um, these students for middle school life and also how they allowed us to get to know each other better um, so that they were more comfortable with me and also with the school once we started back in September. So I have um, ben Baker, Bella Schwarz, and Trey Zerowick here to answer a few questions about Ready, Set, Go conferences and how they felt about them as students here at the school. I think it helped, first of all, because like the first day we did all with our Connections class. So, like, I remember coming like first days and it was like, holy crap, like, I don't know my teacher, I don't know anyone in this class. But I think with the Ready, Set, Go thing, the conference, it was like good to um, like get to know the teacher and the teacher to get to know you because then it was like it, you were comfortable like asking them like, like any question and then when you went back I could ask you like where my classes were and I actually knew who you were so online and not in person is a lot differently and with that ready set go conference I felt confident on like with you guys and yeah it was, it was helpful and and then in the first few days and even like to now i'm like so glad that actually we actually did that because like it's not awkward at all or like and i know like all my teachers now really well well i like that i got to know what you like doing what you like talking about and kind of like that first full day of connections like bell said it made it easier because then i got to know all my classmates and i got to know you, I got to know other teachers that would come into the room every so often. Thank you so much for a few minutes here, Belle, Ben, Trey. Um, we appreciate you telling us about Ready, Set, Go conferences and how they helped you this year. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Anderson and the middle school crew. Um, as we transition to the high school, we're also very proud of much of what we've been able to accomplish. And the work of our leadership team and our department chairs this year has really focused on what is important now and how will that carry us forward. And so collaboration it was absolutely at the very, very top of our list throughout the year. And I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Brad Brunig, one of our instructional coaches. Hello, everyone. As Mr. Pliner said, my name is Brad Brunig. I'm one of the instructional coaches at OHS. Um, the first example uh, we'd like to highlight of meaningful collaboration and service of our learners at OHS is an Educator Roundtable. Um, an edu Educator Roundtable is a virtual conversation amongst OHS educators um, and really an, an opportunity to discuss the tough decisions we have to make in these unique and challenging times, but also a chance to discuss the creative solutions we're using to make these decisions. Um, a roundtable is an opportunity to connect with educators from across the building to support each other and to talk about the things we're currently working through so we can solve these challenges together in service of our learners. The roundtables have been and continue to be student focused, educator wellness focused, and solutions focused discussions. And they've been an important part of our success for educators and students at OHS this year. Next up, I'd like to hand it off to Andrea Anderson, who's gonna be telling us about our AIW teams at OHS. Thanks, Brad. I'm uh, also an instructional coach at OHS. And I just wanted to build on what my friend Laura Brudos and my other friend Andrea Fuller were talking about at the middle school, um, these authentic intellectual work teams or AIW teams. So as Brad was talking about, the Educator Roundtable is a cross-disciplinary um, collaborative opportunity as our AIW teams. So it's a chance to not work necessarily on something 
together, like an interdisciplinary team, but to come as you are, who you are, with the work that you're contending with and uh, working to always grow and improve and really engage with your colleagues from across um, the school in other disciplines to think um, more widely and more broadly about what you have. And so I just wanted you to see um, two of our teams here and see what we look like. As uh, uh, Jackie was talking about, we were able to meet virtually. So just a couple snapshots um, of us. And then the next slide shows um, two additional teams that we have. So 27 teachers um, work together collaboratively on AIW teams at the high school. And uh, I really wanted you to see us because as Laura talked a little bit about, um, it is a framework that is, that is at the center of AIW, but really we know it's the people who take a framework and make it into a game changer. Um, and that's what's happening um, with AIW teams at both of our schools. And this was a really exciting year. You can go to the next slide too, thank you. Um, for AIW to find a home and get nurtured and brought to life at OMS as well. So I appreciated what uh, Chris Cluck asked when he was reading from the back of the Five Levers book. He asked the question, what are the characteristics of initiatives that are most likely to succeed? And I think we know some things about that. Um, they're job embedded, they're ongoing, and they're teacher driven. Um, so here's just, I wanted you to hear us as well, but I'm not going to play a video right now. Um, but here are some comments from, we do a mid-year reflection um, as an AIW team member. So you can really see what people are saying um, about why AIW and the work of AIW teams is so valuable to them. It's not that I need to work harder myself. It's not that I need to dig in deeper um, just with me. It's really that I need to go out and I need to say, here's me, here's what I'm working on. Um, lean in with me and think about some other possibilities with me. And um, then you can see the last um, quote there is just about, this is so valuable. This is what PD um, really should be. And I'm so appreciative that that's what we have here. So I just wanted to say thank you um, to our district for realizing the value um, of AIW and what that's brought to us. This is our third year at the high school of having AIW teams. And then the last slide that I want to share is um, again, bringing teacher voice into, the, into our presentation. Um, and I appreciated uh, Prairie View saying a little bit more about PLC Plus and PLC, PLCs. Um, so we're gonna hear from Chris Wigman, um, a US history teacher, about some of the work that he and his colleagues on the US history PLC have done this year. And then we're gonna go back to that little corner of the district that Kim Manny Brown um, mentioned, room 398, and hear from her, where she'll also bring in some students' voice um, about what's happening in English 12. And those of you who were here a couple of years ago for this meeting, um, heard Kim talk about conferencing uh, with kids. And that, that really made an impact on a lot of us. A number of people have talked to me about that since uh, that meeting a couple of years ago. And it, it'll be delightful to hear a little bit more from Kim. Since last July and throughout the school year, the freshman US History PLC team has been meeting weekly to collaborate around a number of items. In particular, our collaborative work has focused on identifying our course essential standards, framing our curriculum through a thematic approach, and creating lessons with an emphasis on equity. This collaborative work allowed myself and my colleagues to flourish as professional colleagues and to create learning experiences for students that were both meaningful and relevant. Most importantly, however, the PLC model allowed us the professional collaboration time to infuse equity into our lessons in a way that probably had not been done in the past. I want to highlight for you a lesson that's centered around examining the Black Lives Matter movement and the role that race plays in American society. Because of our collaborative time in the PLC, we were able to create a lesson that gave students the space to explore the Black Lives Matter movement and the role that race plays in American society. This also allowed students the time and the space to share their insights 
and the significance of the moment that we are living in. In closing, I'd like to emphasize how important the collaborative PLC time has been to both my professional growth, my colleagues' professional growth, but also in our students' development as they explore an issue that is so relevant to the times in which we live. Thanks. Um, conferences have been a regular part of English 12 for quite some time. And we were really worried that with the online format, it would make it difficult for us to connect with our students as we normally would. After some troubleshooting and problem solving, our PLC worked out a process by which our students could still meet with us one-on-one -on -one to check in, to discuss their progress on the learning targets and the learning progressions, um, and to talk about their writing. Um, and learning targets and learning progressions are the foundation of what we do in this class to help students build competence and confidence in writing and in other skills. Um, and the reflections that students wrote at the end of the first semester really showed us the power of that focus that we maintained. So I want to close with just a few excerpts from their reflections. One student writes, throughout English 12, We've been presented with recurrent targets in a rubric to base our writing skills from each week. This repetition emphasized exactly what targets to incorporate into our responses and how. This format gave me the opportunity to repeat, reflect, and revise my writing skills throughout the school year. Additionally, it has allowed me to explore different aspects of writing. The skills of organization, being proactive, and putting details in writing will follow me moving forward to college and beyond. A second student writes, to be honest, I never felt confident in my writing skills. I always thought it stemmed from my dyslexia, but throughout the school year, I have gained much more confidence in my ability to create richly layered multi-paragraph responses. And finally, from a third student, I learned how to write beautiful responses, manage my time, and just enjoy writing. These are the things I will take with me forever. And as of right now, I definitely feel prepared for college. I am proud of how much I was able to push myself this year and how hard I worked even in these circumstances. Taking this course online taught me more about myself in a semester than I have known during my whole high school career. That no matter what is in my way, even COVID, if I try, I can persevere. since last year. This next slide is entitled Academics, and it certainly could probably a better title for it would be Student Learning. And this year, as you have heard about the important collaboration that went into establishing student learning experiences that were rooted in strong relationships, that there was a high focus on meeting students where they're at, focusing on the essential standards in those PLCs, and then to not only teach ourselves how to teach the critical and important learning targets in a variety of formats, but helping our students learn in those different ways as well. Virtual, asynchronous, flipped learning, and then transitioning back to in-person learning experiences. So there's been a year of change and the focus on establishing strong primary relationships with students, being clear on what we're teaching and how we're assessing has been a bright focus. And we've had the opportunity, Dr. Anderson and I, to speak to the board about format and about um, progress throughout the course of this year. And I know across the country, there have been concerns about learning loss and how does this impact students' next steps? And again, what is really important now um, one of our teachers, Mackenzie Rognes, always has her students participating in a New York Times editorial writing um, experience, and she shared with me a comment that didn't come from an Oregon student, but came from a student addressing that topic about getting students back up to speed. And it, this student from Chicago said, my question becomes, who has determined what up to speed looks like? Adults who went to school over a decade ago and had a normal experience? Categorizing students based upon information that is deemed by society as important to know will not help anyone in the future. Adults must understand that the future they have always been preparing us, students, to take over and lead is ever-changing. Preparing us to face what the future may have in store 
does not require us to master a standardized curriculum. Instead, the curriculum being taught needs to adapt to the current times. This past year, we have gained knowledge about real world issues and their everlasting effects. How can anything being taught in outdated textbooks ever compare to real world experiences? We as students have gained in 2020, 2021 school year. So to answer the question in short, I do not believe that we as students need to catch up with the curriculum, but instead the curriculum needs to catch up with us. And the learning experiences that have been constructed by our PLCs have been based just on that, giving students what they need and helping them adapt to the ever-changing environment, which also, by the way, was on the very first slide that Dr. Bergstrom shared as a part of the Oregon School District mission, um, adapting to an ever-changing world. Next slide, please, Dr. Bergstrom. My good friend, um, Jennifer Schmidt, uh, was unable to be here tonight due to a family obligation, but uh, also wanted to speak directly to the school board with that first bullet, saying that great moments at Oregon High School and throughout this district happened because you supported us by providing opportunities for staff and students. And those opportunities allowed staff to collaborate, to plan, to lead, and then to execute on a highly uh, student-centered way. Uh, teachers were incredibly innovative this year. Uh, it started from the very beginning. Once we knew that we were going to be in a virtual format, our teacher and our teachers led the PD around um, 16 hours of pre-service professional development on Google Classroom, Pear Deck, Live Meets, HyperDocs, distance learning fundamentals, just to name a few. Um, and that teacher collaboration and grabbing the reins and helping uh, one another really lean on the expertise that we have developed in-house will impact this district long into the future. We also know that students learned to learn in a variety of modalities that will also be something that will be in play in this school building as well as others across this district. Students have been able to learn in flexible formats and you'll hear in just a short time other ways in which that is leveraged to help them along their future career paths. And we we'll also are beginning to see new and organic courses that have been established and are being constructed to allow kids to learn in flexible ways. And we look forward to sharing some of those ideas in more depth and detail with the school board in the future. Two pictures here, and I know Jen really wanted to have the opportunity to share. The top one is a peer teaching peer program that is designed to allow our students to have a glimpse of what being an educator, what being a teacher might be about. In specific, um, it is our, our students being able to learn about teaching and being working in our special education program in particular. That Jen is really excited about working with Laura Barrow, who is helping develop curriculum online that our student TAs would have the opportunity to join cohorts to serve their differently abled peers in that special ed classroom setting and to receive feedback from teachers almost as in a student teaching experience and getting valuable pre-service opportunity. Um, really, she's really excited about it. And the second one is we've been working with students who have, during COVID, who have developed business opportunities, and, and these two students are highly engaged in their own businesses and are doing really, really well. And Jen has, has developed a incubator where students cross collaborate to teach one another, to mentor one another, and to learn from one another um, in ways that uh, allow them to uh, serve as mentors, role models, and then develop their own uh, expertise in their business pursuits. And so I know that we're planning to present to the school board soon and she probably will elaborate on that a bit more. And with our next slide, I'm gonna to pivot to Mr. Ashmore. Uh, thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Brad Ashmore. I'm one of the associate principals at Oregon High School. And 
Uh, one of the best parts of my job is the fact that I get to work with a phenomenal team at Oregon High School for OHS Panther Connections. Um, OHS Panther Connections is a little bit new this year. It was formerly known as the Artist of Advisory. And uh, we, we kind of came together uh, last year, board, you probably remember this, we do as well. You asked us, you know, every student at Oregon High School should have a teacher they can connect with for help and support. And we did really rally to that. We knew that it was what our students needed and we stepped up uh, in a huge way to do a lot of amazing things for our students so far this year in OHS Panther Connections. Um, in the next slide, you can kind of see a few of the updates. Uh, previously, Panther Connections advisory was one time to two times a month, um, really not effectual. It was, it was just random. And what we did is we moved those meets to every week for our students. So we get a chance to work with our students each week. And I've got a number of staff that come to me each week and say, Mr. Ashmore, we need to do this. We need to get this in. And our team, uh, Janet Pliner, first and foremost, uh, puts all of that information, all of that organization together. And we've really generated some amazing lessons and, and some amazing things for our students this year. Some of the topics that we've covered in OHS Panther Connections this year at Oregon High School our PBIS, teaching our pride values, uh, social emotional learning, of course, um, wellness. Uh, we've had some wellness lessons. Caitlin Cox has uh, been amazing uh, putting those into the Google Classroom. And then of course, we're focused on equity as well as academic and career planning. And in just a little bit, you hear some of the specific academic and career planning activities we've done in OHS Panther Connections this year. Uh, but the most important part is the impact it's having on our students. We have two student videos. If we could play both of them, uh, they're about a minute in length. And these are two of my connection students. I'm so thankful this year, our administrative team uh, said, we wanna be a part of this too. This isn't just for teachers, this is for everyone at Oregon High School. And I've got two amazing, I should say fabulous freshmen um, that I've been able to work with in connections this year. And they tell their story a little bit about how connections has impacted them so far this year. Hi, my name is Jada Opariado, and I'm a freshman at the Oregon High School. Um, this year, Connections has been great. Um, I've noticed that, well, because of COVID, it's been super hard for both students and staff to come together and connect. Um, connections has offered the opportunity for that um, and allowed us to have a safe space to talk. Um, one thing that I've really enjoyed, I have really enjoyed the, enles the lessons about important things such as sexual assault, um, suicide awareness, equity, equality, etc. Um, building off of that, I think one thing that Connections needs to improve on would be adding more lessons um, like those. And when we do, I definitely think we need to go into more depth, if that makes sense. Um, I do know that this is super hard for the teachers because of COVID to plan these lessons, but yeah. Um, but overall, Connections has been awesome, and I want to say that staff are doing an excellent job. My name is Darren Zimmerman, and I'm going to share a couple ways that Connections has impacted me this year. So this year, I have felt very supported in my connections with both my administrators and my peers. Um, I like that it's this little small group. It's not as big as a normal class, and it feels like there's less pressure put on me when I'm talking or anything, so that's nice. And then I feel comfortable sharing things with my connections um, because everyone is just, it's just a really good group of people. And then um, connections has been beneficial because again, I feel very supported and I know who I can go to if I need help with anything, both school related and non-school related. Our ACP days are something that were beneficial as well because they helped with planning and gave me more of an idea of what I might want to do in my future, which is something very important. Um, I just think that one day, one ACP day was enough though because um, I feel like I was repeating things when we did it again. But overall, that was a nice day to plan. And then for the MSU lessons, I learned things that I didn't otherwise know. And um, just like about different cultures and things that I've never really thought of before. So again, uh, just so thankful for the time those two students took to tell their story and connections, always listening to their feedback. 
Uh, we know it's a great start this year, the repurposing, re-imaging of OHS Panther Connections. And we also know that we can do better. We always can do better for our students. So that's something that we're going to continue to work hard for. Uh, and also moving forward, um, so for next year, we are going to continue with our weekly Panther Connections for students. And we are very excited as well uh, to be able to access character strong social emotional learning curriculum as well to put into our connection. So uh, with that, um, thank you for listening, and I'm going to pass it over to David Pivanetti, one of Hi, my colleagues here, Jado. to talk a little bit more about um, student-centered learning and equitable experiences. Thank you, Brad. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Piovanetti, and I am one of the associate principals here at the high school. You know, with all of the challenges of this school year, we were still determined not to let our commitment to educational equity take a back seat. And the images that you see on your screen are really just a small slice of the ways in which we've kept equity at the forefront this year. Uh, from our Welcome Back Conference at the very beginning of the year to our OHS Equity Book Club that we're so excited about, This Is My America by Kim Johnson that we'll be reading with students and staff and parents and guardians this summer, to everything in between. Uh, our special celebrations around Black History Month, um, educating our student body about uh, the anti-hate speech policy, building um, equity into our curriculum and the changes that we've been making there, uh, student voice through new news magazines like the Change Times. Uh, those are all just some of the ways that equity has been part of our experience this year and some of the things that we're excited to share and really proud to share with you. Uh, next slide, please. You know, it's, it's hard to believe that we're approaching the one year anniversary when our nation was gripped in racial turmoil. turmoil. Uh, I was actually just hired around that time and I remember reading your words, the, the, the words of the board and the district in their statement on racism, reminding us of the important work that lay ahead in the wake of uh, that crisis last summer um, and the uprisings that we witnessed. Our five values, including whole child emphasis and educational equity, commit us to this important obligation that every student deserves an educational environment in which they can achieve their potential without having to climb over systemic hurdles or face unimaginable roadblocks. You went on, each one of us, students and their families, teachers, staff, administrators, school board, and the community play a pivotal role in eliminating racism and unequal treatment of our students of color, and we must take action. Those were the words from June 2020. Uh, they were important words then, they're equally important today, and at the high school, we, we took that charge seriously. Next slide, please. So, you know, from words to action, uh, from words to meaning and bringing those words to life. First around the area of cu curriculum and instruction, um, our theory of action already challenges us to advance equity, social justice, and culturally responsive teaching practices. We added the words this year in ways that demonstrate an anti-racist learning environment. Just looking at some of the images on the screen around the area of curriculum and, curriculum and instruction, we made a lot of strides toward building a curriculum that is more inclusive, that is more relevant to student lives. Uh, like Mr. Pliner mentioned from that New York Times student editorial, where the curriculum catches up with us. And whether it's in US history classes, revisiting essential questions around Christopher Columbus to the books that we're reading in English 9, uh, as the English 9 team tells us the goal is to introduce, introduce students to authors and poets. You see some of them on the bottom of your screen there. Poets that represent a variety of races and cultures and at the same time challenge them to consider their own identities and the lenses through which they move through the world. Mackenzie Rognes, an English 9 teacher, told me, we really feel like we've transformed the English 9 curriculum to focus on our students and the voices that matter in the world. Even in our band classes, there was a focus on black excellence in the arts. In the fall of 2020, you're gonna get to hear our band students playing from the original composition, Unspoken, by black American composer, Kataj Copley. The composer states, after the death of George Floyd, we had our voices taken away from us. This piece represents a voice for the voiceless, and we're looking forward to that. Next slide, please. 
We established an equity education leadership team. This group is the highlight of my week when we meet every Wednesday. Uh, this incredible team made up of teachers, administrators, and the students that you see below on the bottom of the screen there, uh, they represent three different student groups, Allies in Action, Gender and Sexuality Alliance, and the Multicultural Student Union, all working towards the same goal of making our school a more just, safe, and inclusive place for all of our students. Not only has this group provided a space for direct student staff communication on equity related issues, but out of that group this year has come some of the images that you see again on the screen, our uh, equity lessons um, around diversity, around identity, bias, and students coming to terms with their own sexuality. These are just some of the lessons that we've gotten started on this year and some that are gonna continue into next year. And of course, our anti-hate sp speech videos, uh, curriculum conversations with departments. Um, these are really the students who, who energize us and who have helped propel the issues around equity to the forefront of this school year. And so I think it's really important that you hear their voices because they're the ones that are pushing us they're the ones that are helping us to grow as a school and as a district. So on the next slide, you're gonna to get to meet three of those students, uh, Miller Stang, Abelini Espinoza-Brito, and Andrew Beeman, all three members of our equity educational leadership team. We're really making a difference, I feel like, with the connections lessons. Um, that's a huge part of our work with the equity education group. Um, is planning all of those connections lessons. And what I'm very proud of is just the fact that the equity education group exists. The flexibility that the high school has given MSU, GSA, and the allies um, and in being able to communicate with us and also uh, being able to be open to any suggestions and comments or concerns or anything that our groups have to offer and working alongside with us and also treating us as, you know, I'd say with respect and dignity, which is really, really great. Um, and ultimately, you know, just giving us also a voice in the high school. Recently, there's been a lot of more student voice and student collaboration with the administrative body and that's been really helpful because we've had students be able to hear what the administration is doing and then give feedback and I feel like throughout this year we've seen a lot of progress we've seen a lot of videos and connections for example that have been really progressive and really helpful for the student body to know about we've seen curriculum changes we've seen more diversified lessons we've seen more aware teachers, and it's just been really exciting to see. As students, we need representation of ourselves. Um, and currently, like, I'm not seeing that in our curriculum, um, depending on the class. I understand that like a math class is harder, but, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see that more. And that's what I'm really grateful for is that we're, we're starting to realize that we need to be more inclusive. And so we are becoming more inclusive and we're taking those steps forward. But I would really, really, really love to see representation um, that students can, you know, um, connect to and can say, hey, that's me. Oh, I can totally relate to that person. Um, I, I really, really want that to be um, the main focus. The best way to grow is to continue listening to student body and staff body about what they feel should be grown, what they feel we need to work on. And it's not like a simple flip of the switch. It's just something that's going to be a gradual process. But I know if we work together, we will be able to get there faster. I am very grateful that I am in this school district. Um, it's definitely 
a school district where everybody, but especially administration, the school board and our superintendent are very committed um, to helping the students. And I love that whole child emphasis because it shows that at the end of the day, while we are students, we're still human beings. Thank you for all of the things that you have done already. Um, I appreciate all of your hard work and effort. Uh, I think one of the many things that maybe um, y'all could really, really work on is having more teachers of color. I think that would, or, you know, different teachers of that are just not white. I'm just excited that the school is just going forth this way. It's just really happy to see like throughout all my years here, seeing like such like a gigantic leap forth in education is just really exciting. I'm just really happy and graceful, oh, grateful for the future. At the end of the day, we're still human beings. I love those students. Uh, they are my heroes and they make us better every day. Thank you. I believe next we're gonna toss it to the ACP group. All right, so to finish up for the high school tonight, I'm just gonna introduce one of the major jobs that we have at Oregon High School. And I would argue as a district overall K-12 is to make sure that our students are prepared for their future once they are successful graduates of Oregon High School. And our team this year, if you go to the next slide for me, our team this year, we have 12 people and many more um, that are very, very passionate about making sure our students have activities and different lessons to help prepare them for what's next. So I'm gonna turn it over to Greg Granberg. We've had some really great days this year. We've used our uh, Panther Connections again to be able to provide some lessons and some information for our students and for our families for that matter too in regards to how we can help them to be prepared for what's next. Good evening. I am Greg Granberg. I'm the School of Career Coordinator here in the district. Um, as Darian had mentioned, we had three asynchronous ACP days. And you'll see that Zello, the online software that our state provides for us, that does career awareness, college awareness, college prep, career prep, um, shows up in all three. But each of the three days, we had something really big that honestly, of all three of them, I think worked out really well. And if we move to the next slide, in November, we went through and we reached out to our community members. And we said, hey, we're going to do a virtual job fair or career fair. And we would love to hear what your job is and how you got there. And so we sent this out to, I'm going to guess as a staff, maybe 40 people. And from there, it spread. So we've got past graduates like Brittany Peckham on the right. We've got staff members, significant others, like the one on the left. And we've got Tony Evers who also reached out or his office reached out and said, hey, I heard you guys are doing this. Can I join? Can I do one? And we didn't tell anybody no. It was great to have such a broad range of videos for our students to hear, watch and learn from. The cool things, number one, there's over 80 of them. When you get this presentation, that, that link that says see all videos is live and you can go watch as many as you want. The other cool part is over half of them start with hello Oregon High School, hello Panthers, hello I'm a graduate of Oregon High School. How great for these videos to not be national videos but Oregon videos with our community members, our graduates, and people that care about our school. In January, we went through and we looked at four-year planning and having students look out at what are they gonna be doing four years from now. And so for our freshmen, sophomores, they were really looking at what classes am I gonna take at Oregon High School? What programs, what classes, what opportunities do I wanna be ready for? But for our seniors, it's equally or more important. So we've got one from a senior here who's gonna be going to Winona State to study healthcare and wellness management. And so on this day, they went and they looked and in the purple there, you will see the beginning of the classes they're gonna to have to take. 
as a college student earning that major. We had similar forms for military, apprenticeship, technical college, working where they would kind of look at a resume and find job postings. So again, making sure it adjusts to every student's future plan. And in March and April was amazing. We did OHS readiness profiles. I will ask that we watch this short video here of about three minutes, then I'll talk a little bit more about our readiness profiles. Hi, my name is Ada Marston, and I'm a freshman this year. I have grown within my learning is being able to adapt to my surroundings better. I just feel like I'm more confident within like asking questions or getting my work done on time and stuff like that. Hi, my name is Alex Stoffker, and I'm a freshman. And seeing how upperclassmen acted, I knew that I needed to take school more seriously and my work more seriously. Hi, I'm Carly Fahey. I'm in ninth grade. I'm most excited in the future for the people I'm going to meet and the friends that I'm going to make. And I'm a little concerned to not have it all fully planned out now, but I know it'll all work out. Hi, my name's Nate. Um, I've gotten really good at managing my time and planning out bigger projects and smaller assignments in school. I am Anna Martin and I am in 11th grade. I am most interested in human services and psychology. Hi, my name is Hannah Fulmer. I'm a junior at OHS this year. I've just found methods that help me stay organized in my work and classes throughout the year. Hi, I'm Cole Creer and I'm a ninth grader. Due to the pandemic, I've learned better time management, how to handle my time better, especially during um, online school. My name is Lilica Bauer and I am in 11th grade. As a learner at OHS, I've definitely improved on my ability to cooperate with other people. Hi, my name is Isabella Noka, and I'm a senior here at Oregon High School. I'm excited just to experience something new and um, go out of my comfort zone and really push myself. Hi, my name is Henry Kreckman and I'm a freshman. I've grown as a learner at OHS by becoming more organized. I'm Bella Intim and I am a senior. I have definitely become more confident and um, I'm not like afraid to ask questions. Hey, my name is Raul. Uh, I'm a senior. I'm most interested in pursuing childcare or teaching. Uh, I volunteered for a few hours at ODI. After two hours, I decided I loved it there. The career that I want to pursue, it, it requires going to college. I kind of want to go into the music field. An athletic trainer, just because I love being around sports. I would like to get better at managing money. I'm most interested in pursuing a career in politics. Not necessarily working with other people, but the science of working with people and being a leader in general. I want to attend a four-year university. I want to become a chemical engineer. Being able to communicate effectively over technology rather than just in person will be helpful in the future. My volunteer experiences have really helped me to like think about other people more than myself and consider others. Music has always been um something that has helped my mental health and always helped me stay happy. And I spent a lot of time listening to music just to kind of wind down and get my mind out of that work mindset. I definitely joined a lot of clubs and I think that um, helped me keep mentally healthy. Being happy um, with what I'm doing and pursuing my goals and dreams that I've had since I was a little kid, I probably could do that. I probably could. Hi, my name's Ada Marson, and so I'm a freshman this year. went through with this and told students, hey, here are five questions to answer. Shoot a little video answering these questions. We have 600 videos that we now have the opportunity to go through and watch and learn about our students. And I believe Mr. Pliner is leading the group right now at about 100. But if you think YouTube or the internet can be a rabbit hole you get sucked down into, these 600 videos are amazing of what our students want to do, what they have done, and what they've learned. Once again, if you're interested in watching some of those videos, please reach out to Mr. Ashmore because he can add you into the Flipgrid and see those. And as a school, we're working on moving those into a platform where all of our teachers can see it. As we look at going forward, a couple of big things that we're looking at doing. One of them, you saw our team of 12. We're looking at expanding that and engaging our staff more directly with our academic and career planning for each of our students. Second one, and we heard this from Miller, Ebelini, and Andrew, 
we need student voice. We also heard this from Darian, maybe not in the most positive light with, you know, I didn't think I needed all three days, but that's okay because I guarantee you Darian will be invited to be on our student group next year to help plan our ACP and help us move forward. You can see some other th big things there, but a real big one is that profile of an OHS graduate. What do we want our students to be and look like as they are leaving Oregon High School? And we know the school board is gonna be meeting in June and working on that profile, that vision, that picture of what every OHS graduate will be. And we're excited to work with and alongside and for the board and making sure that comes to fruition next year and beyond. So our students are the best prepared for whatever they have next in their life. And that's the goal of our academic and career planning. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Pliner for a close. I think it goes back to Dr. Bergstrom at this point. Uh, thank you all. I think what we'll do is uh, just go right into the themes because for those of us who've been very privileged to be here from five o'clock on and listen to this, oh, I'm sorry, I took off my mask. I was so excited. <laughs> um, the idea of the fact that 4K through grade 12, when we ask them, what did you want, to, what do you want to amplify moving forward? Everyone said the same thing in a different way because we teach, we, we work with students at a different level of their, of their development and their understanding. But this allowed us, and I love the, um, the burned prairie analogy, right? But it allowed us to understand what is most important to the success of our students, to the type of community we want to be for them and for one another. So uh, thank you all for everything that you uh, did to make it happen this year. And I'm excited for our future. And we will be able to give you uh, feedback from the board at a later date, not tonight, because tonight we have to let them process and think about this for a little bit. Uh, but in the future, we'll be able to uh, let you know what really stuck out as critical and um, just give you the information that I think it will be really helpful to hear when you have people who are listening to you for the very first time. And also, I'm sure you'll be very excited to get some feedback from Mr. Uh, from Dr. Rickaba too. So we'll make sure all of that happens. Uh, but for now, we're going to take a, a couple of minute break and then um, go back into, or go into an actual uh, board meeting so that the board can have a discussion, however brief, because the time is, is, is moving on, but a discussion this evening, an initial discussion about what they all just heard. So thank you everybody. And uh, we will adjourn this portion of the evening. Ms. Bijak? Here. Ms. Garrison? Here. Mr. Mary? Here. Mr. Mary, can you say one more time? Here. Here. Ms. Lakuta? Here. Ms. Brun? Here. Ms. Pankrat? Here. Ms. Flanagan? Here. Uh, the board has. Do you want me to unmute it or not? Yes, please. Uh, the board has a forum. Um, and I have received notice that this meeting has been posted. 
Um, so I will, our agenda item this evening is school leadership team presentations. So I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I will turn it back over to Elizabeth. Uh, thank you. Now we know that uh, people can't stay as long as we might like to right now because I think there's a lot that's on our minds. But what we would be very helpful is if the board could continue to process what they heard, look over their notes, and then we'll be sending out a form where you can put in the type of feedback or ask the questions that you would like answered um, by the leadership teams. So that will come out later. Tonight is just for you to thinking and processing. We would have had some more discussion had we had time. However, we, um, you know, we had a bit of a, a longer presentation and I think it was worth every minute. <laughs> However, Dr. Rickabaugh came here um, uh, an hour plus drive and he has been able to watch our evolution as a district for several years now. And so um, I would really like to take advantage of the fact that he is here with us tonight and get some of his initial thinking um, that we can then uh, toss about in our minds and consider as we're preparing our own feedback for the teams. So do you mind, Dr. Rick, about talking a little bit about what you, what you heard this evening? Happy to. I'll be just a minute or two. I could do probably an hour because there's so much. <laughs> and it was, it was absolutely great. But let me, I think I've boiled it down to about five points. So, so the first one is, as I've worked with and watched school districts over the past year, their sort of response to the pandemic falls in two broad categories. One group of school districts have, have sort of focused on their mission around learning and asked the question, what do we need to do to make it safe for that to happen? The other group said, we got to focus on the safety and to the extent we can, we'll let learning happen. And that doesn't, that may seem semantical, but the implications of that are huge. And so as I listened tonight, what I heard was learning is what we do. Learning is our mission. We'll take care of our learners, but we won't lose track of what we're about. And that's a really, and I would just tell you, that's a really big deal. It's a big deal. So uh, that's sort of point one. <clears throat> um, around that, what I heard was, we've got the same goals, we have the same values. What happened this year is that we had to flex the paths, we had to create some new paths, but we didn't go a different direction. We were still focused on what really matters. As a result of that, so that's sort of point two, Point three was growing out of that then is increased capacity, lots of collaboration, and this sort of commitment to all learners that came back and back and back in social emotional learning, yeah, ACP, but it was around this idea of how do we make sure all learners not just have a shot, but they have the support to make that shot count. So it's sort of point three. Uh, point four is a challenge. And that is, much has been learned, much has been accomplished. But the pandemic that has been the stimulus for it will eventually pass. Unless you're planful and committed, you risk losing much of what's been learned and accomplished as people fall back into old routines. So I just say, as you're thinking about moving forward, what are the ways you can capture What's been learned? What's been, where's the growth been? So that when we go maybe forward to normal, whatever that normal is, it's reflective of what's been learned, what's been accomplished in the past year. And then sort of the last point as I was listening, it just struck me that there are two continua that seem to play out in most of the reports. From a staff perspective was this, a really, I think, loud message around collaboration leading toward collective efficacy. That is, it's one thing to collaborate, share information, share strategies. But collective efficacy is shown to be a, it's a huge, it's a huge advantage to reaching all kids because at its core is 
This belief that is that we're capable of making all learners successful, collective efficacy. The second continuum is around <clears throat> the learner. And that is, I heard a lot about um, self-regulation, self-agency, building in learners the sense that they can be successful, helping them learn strategies for that to happen, leading toward, in this case, learner independence. Um, and Chris Cluck talked about this in terms of this whole idea that the most successful learners in this situation were learners who had a skill set, had self-regulation, were able to be independent learners. And the caution is when the pandemic is over, there will be some pressure to go back to having kids becoming increasingly dependent on adults. And that's not a bad thing as long as that's not the only thing. There's some dependence, but, the, but what we really are trying to do is help today's students become independent, skilled learners, regardless of where they go. So that's my sermon for the night. There's a whole lot more, but it just it struck me. Those pieces popped out at me in terms of, I think, being really important themes, important observations that people shared with us. So. So a couple things. Um, what do you want to say? No, go, go right ahead. So a couple things. Um, one is, this is one of the best nights we have as a school board. I always get emotional when we talk to Jim about this. These presentations make me emotional because it makes me so honored and proud to be a school board member in this district. We have such a committed team of administrators and educators, and this is where we get to see it firsthand, and I wish that our whole community could be a part of this because it makes me so proud to have my kid be in the school district. So don't lose that piece either. Second, Leslie and I will talk about how we had this discussion if we add it to the board meeting on Monday night or not because I want to have this discussion when it's fresh. And then the third thing I would say is take some time when you get home tonight and gather your notes based on things that Jim said. You know, what is educator teacher focused? What have we learned about student learning? and make sure you gather those notes and what are your top three to five points so that we can have that discussion, but do it while it's fresh. Um, but thank you so much for putting this together. This was amazing. Jim, thank you for being here. Um, I'm proud, I'm proud to be a part of this school board. So I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Okay, there's a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, we are adjourned at 746. Thank you guys for spending.